Here today, I will uh, introduce to you to two of my colleagues. But first, uh, let me tell you about Metro Digital. Metro Digital is the software provider for uh, Metro Cache and Carry. So we are in the same group with Metro Cache and Carry. Uh, actually, it's the only customer of ours. So um, we don't have too much uh, business to cover uh, for multiple customers. So um, also you can find us uh, downstairs at the booth with our uh, innovative concept, which is called Check Out This uh, Store. It's actually a simplified store uh, where we try to simplify also the checkout experience for our customers. But uh, the workshop today is not about uh, the checkout list store. We actually came with a second business case, which is much more simply uh, to fit in uh, this two hour uh, session of workshop. And today we will detect empty shelves. Why? Because this for Metro Cash and Carry, it's really, really important to know each time when a particular shelf uh, gets out of uh, stock. Uh, because uh, the data that we have, it's um, uh, known only after the customer exits the store when uh, he gets the invoice. So while he is journey through the shop, through the store, and the medium um, journey in the store for a customer, it's about one hour. So during this period of one hour, we don't have this data. So the only thing, it's uh, the only way to know when the store gets out, uh, the shelf gets uh, out of stock, it's by monitoring the shelves. So um, I don't want to uh, keep you much. This is actually our first object detection during our um, projects. And now let's jump to the fun part and you will uh, meet Eddie and Theo, which are the experts in machine learning. Thank you. My name is Eddie and today I will um, present to you an introduction, hopefully not boring introduction to machine learning, uh, but uh, it will not be a didactic presentation, you know, like the one that you find online with MNIST and uh, carefully catered data sets which work just fine for everything you want. It's something with real world data, so results will be fuzzy, messy, uh, you have to be prepared for this. Is my screen? Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. First of all, I need everybody to go to this link. Um, does everybody have a Google account? So is anybody without a Google account? Good. So we will be working on Google Colab because we, we already have a, a, a notebook there. Uh, if you want to work on your uh, on your computer, you could do it as well. But it is easy, easy to to work uh, on uh, the the notebook online. So go to this link. It it is a link to a Google Drive folder, and you just have to access the notebook and make a copy of the notebook to your own Google Drive, so you could modify and run it and do everything you want on it, because this public version is read-only. Um, so I, I said, as I said, this will be with uh, real-world data. Uh, we don't have lots of data in this notebook, so it will run fast. Um, we, in this notebook, I think we have uh, a thousand and something images, so it is enough uh, to do the introduction, uh, but for the production model, we have like 100,000 images which we had to label and so on, but it will, t will take very long, so it is not the place for uh, those. Um, at the end of this workshop, I linked to, I put two, two links 
to some Google workshops which are very didactic, so if, if somebody wants to go in depth to some of the concepts, they could uh, go afterwards. Okay, so Gabi told you about the business case. So we want the shelves to have products on them as much time as possible. So the time with empty shelves to be the minimum. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, we will need to download our data sets. And uh, the first uh, two commands, download uh, zip archive uh, with images, and the second one will download a sample image, which we'll talk about later. So, um, is everybody familiar with Google Collab? Is, does, if somebody needs help about how to run, uh, Theo will help you, Theo here. <laughs> Uh, we'll help you, we'll show you how to run cells and ask, uh, answer your questions regarding this. So, the first two cells, uh, we use GDown for downloading uh, in the link that you accessed. There's a zip archive and an image. We download them in this local environment. You can run cells by just pressing Shift Enter. <coughs> and Next, we will have to unzip the archive. Um, while it is unzips, uh, I would like to know how familiar are you with machine learning and computer vision? Uh, meaning, how, how many, raise a hand, how many of you worked with comp uh, convolutional neural networks up until now? Okay. And how many of these have worked with more advanced uh, networks like YOLO, Efficient, that... Uh... Okay. So for you, it might be a little boring, this presentation, uh, because it's an introduction, but I'm glad that uh, you are here, so we will go together through this uh, experience. Um, okay. I think I already have unzipped it. And now let's check that the, the files are there. Okay, so uh, Google Collab has a, a Ubuntu backend where you can run uh, command lines by using the exclamation mark at the beginning. So basically you see here I put an exclamation mark and then ls, it shows me the files in the, the folder I selected. So I checked that everything is fine. Now let's go to the introduction. So what is machine learning? <laughs> we have to go through this, I'm sorry. Everybody today uh, says, oh, our company, our project, uh, we use machine learning and AI and computer vision, AI vision, and other buzzwords. But I have very few except for the actual uh, practitioners, know what these mean. So here is like a large blah blah, but um, long story short, artificial intelligence is the field which tries to make computers do what our minds do, more or less, okay? So we basically want to replicate the human mind. And what is machine learning then? Machine learning is one way to achieve this. So it is a subfield of AI, let's say. But then you have computer vision, which today is all the rage. You know? uh, since 2012, when uh, convolutional neural networks started uh, being mainstream after AlexNet, uh, everybody says computer vision here, computer vision there. Um, actually, computer vision and machine learning have a very uh, large common uh, field, but computer vision is much more than just the learning part. You have computer vision in the 60s and the 70s with Kenny Edge, with morphological operations. You have classical image processing, which are very powerful tools, and they are part of computer vision. Um, and of course, we all want to achieve AI, and you can achieve AI without learning, but that would be Absolutely barbaric. You know those colleagues that write like hundreds of if-else? That's trying to achieve AI 
without learning. Good. So, as a relevant terminology, when we, when we say model, we mean uh, a neural network or something similar which is trained, which learned from data. Training is the process of learning. Uh, then we have the training set and the test set. So the training set is a subset of the data which we use to make it learn. And the test set is an other subset, uh, disjunctive with the first one, which is used to test. Actually you have train, test, validation, and so on. But this is what I'm talking about. And when we say feature, uh, usually we uh, in computer vision, it, it means that we extract it, extracted something from an image. For example, um, in the old days before convolutional neural networks, if you want to detect digits, the number of digits, you would have to do some Laplacian stuff on the image and then extract some features, which were a series of numbers, and then use a neural network on that. Convolutional neural networks do this automatically. So this is what we mean by features. Okay, now let's get to the unpleasant part, the quick math. Um, you cannot do machine learning without uh, math. So you need some basic understanding of some concepts. Uh, well, if you use more advanced models, you'll need to understand more, but the gist of it is that um, some of the math concepts that we learn in high school, for example, like the, de the basic idea of a deri derivative is essential for machine learning. So let's buckle up and explore the, briefly explore the math. We will not uh, stay too long on this. So this image we see here, <coughs> It is something which plagued most of us in high school, like the definition of the derivative. It seems needlessly complex, but the truth is that the derivative, it is a very beautiful concept which helps us a lot. So basically, what a derivative, uh, when we uh, refer to a function, it tells us how fast the function will uh, increase its y value or decrease its y, y value in a small amount of time. So basically it tells us if the hill is upwards or downwards and how abrupt it is. And this is very important for learning. Um, also partial derivatives are important because we don't have uh, single feature uh, models. We have multiple features so we'll, we'll have to do partial derivatives. Uh, then we have the algebra part with vectors and operations and norms and so on, but this has a, a smaller impact on us because um, the basic um, learning algorithm don't imply them too much, but the part with the derivatives are at the core of the learning process. Um, but for machine learning and data science in general, um, norms are very important. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, heard about uh, the Manhattan distance, which is a distance which you, you measure on the streets of Manhattan, which is not a straight line, you go like on a grid. And the Euclidean distance is when you go on a straight line. But also you will have situations like this here, <coughs> where you'll have a basic group of data, the blue uh, circles, and you will have two other groups of data which you want to know if they are part of the main group or not. <clears throat> and as you can see, if you will use the uh, Euclidean distance, you will say, yes, both are uh, equally close to the distribution. But we can visually see that this is a lie. So this is why we will need to use something like a Mahalanobis distribution, which is next level uh, norm. Uh, it is a little more complex to have the actual math for this. But the basic idea is that the Mahalanobis distance looks at the, <clears throat> the main group and says, hey, this is something like an ellipse, so data will be more distributed through an axis and, more, uh, uh, and less distributed through the other axis. So if a group of data uh, is uh, like the, the red uh, axis here, 
despite the fact that it is close to the center of the distribution, it is far because the variation on that axis is very small. <coughs> of course, vector multiplication uh, is present uh, everywhere. Uh, also, statistics is very important with the Bayes theorem and all the nice stuff there. Um, but the, all the parts in statistics are intertwined with machine learning. Um, I, I, actually, I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm uh, finishing my PhD in machine learning. And my sister is a math uh, mathematician finishing her PhD in machine learning. So we have <laughs> different views on this uh, matter. So for her, machine learning is more of a statistics-related uh, field because she teaches statistics. And for me, it's more of a, like engineering-related field because I teach engineering. Uh, but the truth is that um, all this field, uh, every little piece of math that you can understand and use is a plus. It, is, it makes a huge difference. And we will see a little further when we will talk about classic image processing and how powerful classic image processing is. Because everybody today wants to do deep learning and all the nice stuff, but they forget that they have simple and efficient tools for simple, uh, for less complex tasks. Um, of course, the, uh, the Gaussian distribution with the three sigma rule, where everything which is outside the three sigma uh, further than the median is called an anomaly. It is very useful inclusive in machine learning to say, hey, I have this data set and some of the data are very weird, so I'll just throw them away because they don't fit a normal distribution. Or you will have, um, you can use the interquartile range uh, where you have uh, um, 25th percentile and 75th percentile and you will allow data at, l at most 1.5 interquartile range uh, at the end of these two percentiles. So another method to detect anomalies. And detecting anomalies, as I said, is very uh, important. Uh, although it is mundane and we do it like, yeah, just run this uh, function from this library and does it automatically, it is important to understand, at least a basic, to have a basic understanding of what and, and how the library does that. And now, <clears throat> at the core of learning, of machine learning, we have the human neuron, which was the inspiration for learning. So what is a neuron? Neuron has a nucleus, it has dendrites and an axon. So it receives data through ions and other nice stuff, chemical. Uh, it processes it through some biological wizardry and then sends data uh, further, yeah? So it's basically, a, it is a basic processing unit. So mathematically, we could have a neuron, so an artificial neuron, which is less complex than the actual neuron, uh, summed up like this. You will have a basic processing unit which receives n uh, values from whatever, input or other neurons. And it has some weights which uh, they apply on each of these values. <coughs> and at the end, after the linear multiplication with these values, you will have an activation function. And the activation function determines the output of the neuron. Can somebody tell me why do we need an activation function? to have nonlinearities, Because if you see here, we have n pieces of data, uh, n minus one weights, and we will have like a linear multiplication. So we will be able to do, for example, linear separation between data. But we know that not all data are linear, linearly separat separatable. For example, if you have a, <coughs> a cluster of values in a disk, and then a ring around it, you cannot separate them with a, with a line. Of course, you could project it into a, a, for a higher dimension and then you will have a hyperplane to separate it, but as it is, you cannot separate it. And actually, this activation function, it is at the root of um, the universal learning theorem, which is a theorem sa which says that the <coughs> a neural network can learn everything with an asterisk which says, approximate almost everything. 
because a neural network basically will have like a linear approximation of a function for a land linear, uh, composed linear approximation. Imagine if you have a circle, you can approximate it with a high level polygon with 20 uh, layer uh, sides. So activation functions are very important. Basically they do all the magic behind a neuron, otherwise a neuron will be just a multiplier. Um, and we have multiple activation functions today. Uh, we have the classical sigmoid, uh, the hyperbolical tangent, uh, of course our lord and savior Relu. Um, but why did, why did we have to get rid of the sigmoid activation function? What was the flaw of the sigmoid? Anybody knows? Vanishing gradient problem. Because when we have a sigmoid function like here, uh, as I said, the learning process is based on derivatives. So basically you go, you uh, feed data one direction, then you get feedback at the end of the ne neural network, and then you have to change all the weights in the back propagation by finding the derivatives, by computing the derivatives. And the problem is that the sigmoid uh, function derivative it is uh, maximum 0 0.25. So that's the maximum value. And when you multiply multiple values, which are m at most 0 0.25, it will t tend to zero. So the gradient will vanish and there <coughs> no further learning will happen. This is not a problem for small networks like two or three layers, but when you go deeper, <coughs> this will be uh, a more uh, occurring uh, problem, more often occurring. Um, why do we have leaky ReLU then? Why is not ReLU so good? Because ReLU, it is very good, but it also has some problems. The fact that every, every negative value, <coughs> it is uh, projected to zero, it means that sometimes, in some circumstances, neurons can die. For example, if you have a cluster of neurons which by accident happen to have only negative values, they will fit forward zero, 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 and basically it's like the piece of brain died. That's why we have leaky relu, which is a, a function which allows negative values to have some value, but they are very, very dampened. Yeah? Uh, now, I think, I don't know, Google uh, came with the swish function, uh, activation function, which uh, everything which is, which tends to minus infinity is zero, but around minus 10 to zero, it allows a small uh, uh, dampening for the negative values. So the thing is you have different activation uh, functions for different problems. You have to try them out, you have to understand them and see what, uh, to understand what problems could appear by using them. Here, <coughs> here we have a very simplified uh, f function of how um, a neural network learns. So here, this parabola, it is the, uh, func the cost function. So basically the error, yeah? And if you use the uh, very well-known uh, mean squared error function, it will be a parabola because it, has, it is a sum of squares. And the, the parabola, it is a very simple uh, function because it has guaranteed one single minimum point, which is the tip of the par parabola. So if you have a function like this, it is very easy to go to the minimum error. You just see, hey, where, where am I? Yeah, and then you, you find the gradient, the direction of the function, and you go downwards in small steps until you, you don't make any further progress. Basically, uh, it is like climbing down a hill. If you want to climb, of, of course, we don't do this in, uh, real time, in real life. If you want to climb down a hill, we don't go to the steepest <laughs> uh, direction, no? We just go to the easiest to walk direction. But in machine learning, it just looks around and says, where is the steepest? Here, makes a step. Then, where is the next steepest? And then step. And we have here an image. So imagine this is from Andrew Ng's 
very well known the introduction to machine learning. So imagine you're on the red hill and you make small steps trying to get to the lowest of the depressions there. Then we have here a bin binary cross entropy. This is a very important function because not every time we can use mean squared error or something like this. Imagine that we want to uh, do classification and we have 10 things that we want to classify. We need to be able to evaluate how well our uh, model um, predicted um, the classes. So on the upper uh, vector, we have the uh, ground truth where we have 10 classes and the class of the, the specific object that we want to classify can be anything. It is the class number six. So it is a guaranteed 100% uh, it's six. This is the ground truth. This is human labeled. On the bottom vector, we have the results of the uh, network. And we can see that no network will give you 100% confidence that yes, this is this class. It will give you a distribution of quasi probabilities. They're not actual probabilities, but computed probabilities. And you can see that on the sixth label, you have 0 0.8, which dominates all the other values. So you say, okay, with a high probability, it must be class number six. And then this cross entropy function gives you a value by comparing these two vectors and telling you how well you guessed. So a perfect guess will be when the, the neural network will say 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So it'll say exact as the ground truth. In reality, it will be like 0 0.9, 0 0.95, and so on. Okay. Now, let's get to our data set. First of all, we will have to import the, the tools for the job. So we use uh, OpenCV, uh, NumPy, uh, TensorFlow, Seaborn, and Matplotlib for plotting and um, scikit-learn for splitting the data, and some um, function from Google Colab because uh, Google Colab has a weird interaction with uh, uh, OpenCV, with uh, showing images and uh, CV dot weight and so on. So we use CV2 underscore I'm show from Google Colab patches. Um, then we set the seed. This is very important if you want to uh, develop neural networks, we have to set seed in order to have deterministic results. Uh, I don't know what happened, but Google Colab was not responding to this. It was not very deterministic. On the local machine, it worked. A few months ago, the setting of the seed worked. I don't know what's happened now. Maybe for you, it works. I don't know. But these uh, are the, the, the lines of code we want to do to have deterministic and reproducible networks. So we can see that not random chance or random luck made our network to be better, but the changes that we made uh, had an impact. Okay, so we run this to import. And then, this is just for debugging. Here we have <coughs> the path to the data set because we downloaded that zip and unzipped the data. Now the data is uh, in this folder, shelves 21 September 2022, labeled. And we define here a function uh, called uh, read images, where we look in that folder, take all the images in the folder in a, in a list, read the image, resize them to, to, a, uh, to a predetermined uh, size, 64 by 64. We did this to uh, be a speedy process. Uh, but in reality, the images are pretty small, so more than 100 by 100 will not help, so will not help anyway. Okay, so we read the, the image, we resize it, and append it to the X um, vector. Then we extract uh, the label from the name, because these are uh, the images, if you look upwards, let's see. Okay, this is a, these are the names of the images. So this you can ignore. This is basically the timestamp and blah, blah, blah when the image was taken. Um, the next value after the timestamp is um, 
the shelf position in the rack because we will have like multiple shelves. And then we have the label. Label underscore and the value between zero and 100. <coughs> the label represents an estimated percentage of how full a shelf is. So we said, okay, human pos humanly possible it is to estimate by 10% granularity. Less than 10% will be like just, I'm guessing. Even for 10% it was hard sometimes. But we said um, that we want to alert the shopkeepers when the a shelf is getting empty, not when it's empty, when it's about to get empty. So uh, it will be more, lo more like of a binary classification, like send alert or not send alert. But we said, okay, since we still, we, since we label the data, let's label it as fine gran granul as granular as possible. So if in the future we will need to do something else, we don't have to relabel the data anymore. Even more than this, the shopkeeper might say, hey, I want you to alert me when it's 20% for some products and when it's 50% for some products because some products are bigger, some are smaller. So that's why we did this. We labeled tens of thousands of images. But uh, does it, who labeled data uh, for object detection among you? Raise a hand. Oh, the others don't know the pain of it. <laughs> oh, this is... I think I, I'm past one million images labeled. Um, basically, you have a program, uh, sorry, you want to say? Oh. Uh, you have a program where it gives you the image, you put a rectangle uh, on the object that you want to detect, write the label, then go to the next, next object and so on. So it's very tedious. But for this specific uh, task, I said, okay, I will not be doing this, I will crop each individual shelf and do a computer vision, uh, an OpenCV label uh, script, where it just gives me an image, I press a button like from zero to nine, which means zero, 10, 20, and so on, and F for full, 100%. So it is like, this is the labeling process, just pressing a, uh, a button, which is much faster than doing the rectangle stuff. Um, okay, now let's go back. Okay, so this is why here, when we extract the label, we say, okay, uh, partition the name of the function. Uh, if you don't know, uh, for ho those who don't know, partition is a function which uh, separates a string based on a, a delimiter. So it takes a string, it finds the first match for the delimiter, and then it gives you the first part, the delimiter, and the second part. So here I take the second part, so what is after label underscore, so basically the value, and um, then uh, I remove the extension, the dot PNG. Afterwards, I divide the label by 10 because our labels are from zero to 11, to 10, so there are 11 labels, and the labels which we labeled were in the tens, then we transform both of these in NumPy arrays and return them. Good. Now we call the function. And now we have X and Y. Let's see how these vectors look like. So X dot shape. Shape. And y dot shape. This will give me the size of the dimensions of the vectors. So we can see that we have uh, 1,318 uh, images, and the x uh, vector contains the images, which have 64 by 64 by 3, because it has three color channels. And the other ones are just a vector of 1,318 1, uh, values, which represent the actual label, the 0, 1, 7, and so on. Let's plot the images to see how, uh, plot some of the images, not all of them. So these are uh, the shelves. As you can see, they are not very intelligible for us as well. 
when you will see the big picture, they will be more clear for you. But there are um, some, some of the artifacts that you see here are not from resizing and so on, are just because we have uh, refrigerators of which we took images. And when somebody opens the door and closes it, some fog goes on the, on the, <laughs> on the glass. So you will see very foggy images, but you have to work with this. But you can say, hey, uh, the first image you see that the label is seven. And you can see that is more than half full with stuff. It doesn't matter with what it is. We just want to have like a volumetric estimation. Doesn't matter what it is there. Um, then the second one has a label 10, which means it's full. I can tell you this is not full. This is more like 80, 90%, but because of the fog, I label it with 10. So I label it with what I see, not to what I think it was there. I wanted it to be as objective as possible. And in order to do this, I label the images, Theo label the images, Gabi label the images independently, and then we took a median value. And as you can see here on the second row, the third value is an empty shelf. It is pretty clear that it is empty, and so on. So this is the data we work with. Um, let's see one of the images bigger. So this is the data. <laughs> Uh, so when your neural net network doesn't uh, behave as you expect it, don't smash it. it this is what it sees. Um, this is one full one. Let's show. Let's see the one at the index 20. So this is clearly an empty shelf. Yeah, and the first one. This is one the, the one which was labeled with seven. Um, and basically, this was our goal, what you see here. This is an image, yeah? And we want to tell uh, the shopkeeper, for all the ones, there's no problem, but for the zeros, there's an alert, come as fast as you can. And you can see the zeros are for empty shells, but, and also for quasi-empty shells. So this is our goal. This is actually our result with a more complex network which took, I don't know, one or two hours to train on a 390, GT, RTX 390, so it is hard to do it here. Um, but what we do here, it is a very good start if you want to do this for uh, other projects that you want. Volumetric estimation has many applications in real life. <coughs> so, we have to honor our ancestors. As I said, everybody now wants to do deep learning and AI vision and computer vision and so on, but people forget about the tools that we have for literally decades. Like there are libraries, for example, Canny Edge, I think it was patented in the 60s, so it's 60 years of Canny Edge. And um, they are very important, very, very important. And let's see why. Here, uh, the images that we collected are from a camera with a fisheye distortion, which is very annoying for when you want to do anything image processing related. And here we have the code that we use to undistort the fisheye. So basically the values K, D, and K, these uh, at the beginning were empirically determined. This is a a very abused word when you want to say, I tried random shit and it worked. <laughs> it was empirically determined. <laughs> um, but basically we, we had a, a chess board and placed it on multiple places of the image to see the distortion and we had another algorithm which gave us these numbers and said, okay, this might be good. And um, this, uh, this cell actually undistorts an image. I will run it. Uh, <coughs> and it undistorts it using uh, OpenCV, so it doesn't use anything fancy. And let's see how the Im original image looked like. So, this was how our cameras uh, did data acquisition, another buzzword. 
Um, so you can see that the distortion is pretty pronounced and uh, actually we cannot, <coughs> we cannot uh, use all the shells that we see here. And we decided that we will use the five uh, most uh, visible shelves, the one in, in the middle and the two on the sides. Because if you can look at the, one on the, the ones on the left, it is almost impossible even for humans to estimate accurately what's inside and how much is inside. So we, uh, we had this image, then we undistorted it, and when you undistort fisheye, you get this. So it means that when you have fisheye, you will lose data by cropping the, uh, the black uh, margins. As you can see, the, the data in the corners is useless because it cannot be uh, put in a rectangle together with the data in the middle. So another empirically determined, we did the cropping of the image to get the center. And uh, after we crop the images, we get this image, which is decent. Yeah, the five, uh, the five shells that we are interested in are clearly visible. Uh, I think we can stretch it to six maybe, but we said, okay, no, let's, let's keep it simple. Five, in, five uh, shells. And uh, <clears throat> now, uh, before going further with, uh, our, with machine learning models, I want to show you a few classic image uh, processing operations on this image. Uh, they don't do anything fancy for this specific case, but you will see that if you tinker with them, it, they might do. So first we transform it to a grayscale image in order to, to be able to apply Kenny Edge to it. And as you can see, Kenny Edge is very easy to use. It's just cv2.kenny. And you give it the image and you give it two thresholds for the uh, hysteresis, blah, blah, blah. The, the complicated algorithm which Kenny envisioned 60 years ago. <coughs> and Kenny Edge is very fast. As you can see, it does edge detection like it doesn't take more than a second. And now you can see that this data might be useful, having the, the edges. Because remember what I did. I took each uh, level of the shelf and took it in a separate image. So I had to know where is the shelf, so I had to manually, empirically extract uh, and crop them, yeah? So it is a very manual, intensive effort. So it will be very, very useful if you could do it automatically. They're like say, hey, this is the shelf, and you just crop it automatically by doing a very good edge detection. But you will have to get rid of the internal edges and just focus on the margins of the shelves. Um, more than Kenny Edge, which is pretty straightforward, you have the uh, morphological operations. Who knows about morphological operations? Okay, what are of operation, uh, morphological <laughs> operations? You raised your hand shakily, so. Okay, can you give me a, an example of morphological operations? Operation. Okay, problem. <coughs> Let's search Google. Um, open CV morphological operation. Because Open CV has a very good uh, doc. So, you have a um, black and white image, so let's be clear. Black and white, not grayscale. Black and white, just two levels of color. And you have operations like erosion, where you take an image like this J here, and you erode it, you make it thinner. Then you have operations like dilation, which you take an image and make the edges thicker. 
then you have operations like opening, which is a combination of erosion and delation. Uh, delation. So first you erode, then you delate. And as you can see here, you have a J with some noise around. And see, this noise is very similar to the noise that we have with our shelves. We have lots of noise on the, on the bottom and in the shelf, actually, that's noise for us. We don't care about the products. We care about the margins of the shelf. So by doing opening, you remove the, the, the small noise because when you have small dots and you do erosion, they just vanish. And then when you do dilation back, the, the elements which were eroded but they were thicker, they just get back to the original state or very close to their original state. Then you have operations like closing, when you have the reverse problem where the edges have small holes in them. And then you, when you uh, delate, this is a dilation followed by erosion, when you delate you fill the holes and when you erode you turn it back to the original state. And of course, you have other operations like we can do, we can go nuts with, uh, with them. But they are very, very powerful. <coughs> and uh, I don't want to, uh, to stay too much on them. Uh, but <coughs> uh, my master's degree was in image processing and virtual reality and so on, not on machine. Yeah. Okay, so morphological operations is when you take a black and white image and you have a kernel, like a three by three, let's say. You take that kernel and you do the deletion or erosion. Basic morphological operations are deletions and erosions or combinations of them. And you uh, slide that kernel over the image. When the kernel matches an edge, it keeps the edge or it removes the edge depending on the operation. And this is what it does. Yeah, so there, there are operations in order to <coughs> uh, alter the edges. And we can know that uh, sometimes when you want to do contours, for example, most of the times contours have holes and uh, or are discontinued. So morphological operations are one way to fill the holes and make perfect contours. Um, it's okay? Um, okay, so, so I, as I was saying, most of my colleagues uh, did the, the master's degree in artificial intelligence with their fancy courses and so on. Uh, I did it in image processing and uh, virtual reality. Uh, I have some regrets about not doing the AI master, but uh, ev since I'm in computer vision, most of the times when you want to do real world applications, you don't have like a magical network which does everything. You usually have a pipeline of networks. And guess what you have to put between networks? Morphological operations, Kenny Edge, and all other this kind of processing, which they don't teach you in AI master's degree, but they taught me like four courses, uh, in four, not courses, uh, four, uh, what do you call it? Classes, yeah, thank you. Uh, lots of these kind of operations. I don't remember them all, but I know where to search for them. And this is a very useful uh, tool. And I just want to tell you, don't be shy of using classic image processing uh, because when you want to eat, you don't cut your steak with a sword, right? You cut it with a knife. Good. Now let's see how morphological operations will <coughs> behave on our image. So since we did Kenny edge, <coughs> most if not all of the edges will be one pixel wide. So, if we will do uh, an erosion with a kernel by three by three, so the, cur the, size of the, the size and the shape of the kernel determines how the erosion goes. So if I do a three by three erosion on the image, and you can see you, do, you just do a computer, uh, CV2 dot erode, you give it the image, <coughs> edges is the image outputted by Kenny Edge, when I do a three by three, I get blank because the edges are very thin. They just remove them from existence. Like they thought that everything was noise. So if you want to see something which uh, is not <coughs> a black image, we uh, <coughs> change the kernel to a one by three. So now the kernel will match some of the edges, the horizontal edges. 
as you can see, <coughs> sorry, it removed all the vertical data. So now we have only horizontal data. Hmm, this might be useful, right? And horizontal data which, which, which was matching a one by three, but we can go like one by 10 to remove the small uh, edges. And now you can see that you have even less edges. So if you just tinker with these values a lot, you might find, hey, I can work with this. Um, here now we have a, a dilation on the previous image, on this image, <coughs> with a kernel by five by five. Yeah, and you can see that it thickened the edges a lot. So it, it, it evidentiated the edges and it merged some of the edges, which also might be useful depending on what you want to do. Uh, here we have a, a morphological opening, so erosion then dilation on the original edge image. And as you can see, that it, it achieved what we did manually by uh, delay, uh, erosion then dilation. It did it in one operation. We have the horizontal ones. And you can change here. Instead of one by 10, you can give 10 by one. And now you will have vertical data. And you can see vertical data is only when the center shelf is because the other shelves are uh, at an angle. Then you can have the closing of the, the operation. And here you can see that the edges are actually removed and the content is uh, evidentiated, yeah? So I, I will stop here with this, but I just feel bad for people who go and do computer vision and don't know about these things because they are very, very useful. Okay, yes? A rectangle, uh, meaning the shell. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can use a combination, like take the horizontal data, take the vertical data, erode them as much as possible to have as as few as possible edges, combine them, and you might have this. But you also have other tools like ransack and uh, half transform. You know about half transform? You used it once. So half transform, it is useful to detect lines, um, sinusoids, and other regular uh, geometric shapes. And you can use it for that because here not actual rectangles are quasi rectangles, are more like a trapeze. Uh, so you can use, but those are actually still classic image processing. There's not, uh, not nothing fancy there. So yeah, you can use them. Feel free to, to ask any questions at any time. Don't, don't be shy. <clears throat> okay, so this is where the fun begins, right? The neural networks. <clears throat> okay, so before convolutional neural networks, how would we process an image in the 90s, in the 2000s? How would we go by the process of having a neural network which has an input image? Yes, so basically you do feature engineering and extract features, right? Yeah. So I didn't got the last part. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no, you, you, you're, you're, you're right. Um, but um, I, I was going more like, let's say you have a small image. You don't have much features to extract from it. Like you have a 20 by 20 image or 64 by 64 we have here. 
But how do you use all the pixels? Okay, but um, I was saying, in which order you take the pixels? So raster. You just take the first line, the second line concatenated, and so on. Why do we do raster and don't do column-wise? No, it's actually a good... Huh? Memory alignment, exactly. Because we use uh, GPUs and we use caches and so on. So if you want to have, you don't want to have cache misses, you want to align them in a row. But you should remember that in the 80s and 90s when people used Fortran, the memory was column-wise aligned. So Fortran is <laughs> on the columns. Okay, so we do raster. We take all the pixels and pick, make them in a one big vector. This is what we do here. So I made a, a function read data set raster. We take all the images from the folder, uh, we resize them to 64 by 64, and then we reshape the vector by using numpy.reshape um, to 64 multiplied by 64 multiplied by 3, which is, I don't know, 64 by 64, I think is 4,000 something, something to, the, to the 12 or three 12,000 uh, values. So it's a vector with uh, 12,000 12, values. Then we, we append all the values in the X vector. We extract the labels in the same way we did it before, and we make an umpire arrays of the X and Y, and we return them. Good. Now, uh, before going further, we have this chunk which I stole from the internet. Uh, it is very useful because it uh, does some settings for plotting, so we could plot the accuracy and loss of the network as we train it, not afterwards. So it is basically a function for, a, it is a class which gives you a function for a callback to be called each epoch or something like this. So we just run this and say, yay, this is magic. Good. Okay, now here on this cell, we read the data. So we just call the function read uh, dataset raster. <coughs> and you can see that the shape of the X now is 1318 by 12,288. So it doesn't have images, it has large as vectors. Now, <coughs> now we will train a sim very simple neural network where um, <coughs> we use the sequential uh, function from uh, models. Yeah, so basically sequential says that you start from nothing and you just add layers and that's it. So we add an input layer with the shape of 64 by 64 by three, the vector of the values we have. Then we have a dense layer, one single dense layer with 64 neurons, and then uh, the output layer, which is also a dense layer, with 11 values, because we have 11 classes from zero to uh, 10. Then we compile the, the, the model uh, using uh, ADAM and sparse categorical cross-entropy. Remember the function I told you about cross-entropy, which compares to the output vector with the ground truth this is it here. And we will look for accuracy. In real life, accuracy is a good metric if you have very well balanced data set, but you would like to go for precision and recall in other metrics as well to make sure F1 is actually the, the, the metric which uh, gives you the most data. But we, I try to keep it simple here. So we compile the model. We uh, create this function by uh, calling the constructor of plot training. Plot training is the magic I told you about before. And then we just fit the data with train, test, 30 epochs, batch size which we set 128. And here is the, at the callback section, you can see at the end, we give an array with just one function which is this function, plot training. So this plot training will plot the results of the training as we run it. 
As you can see, the, the train is with uh, blue and uh, with orange is the validation. And for those of you who are colorblind, I'm, I hope you see the data somehow. I, I don't know if this is an issue for people. And as you can see, uh, the, the training is pretty fast. It, do, it doesn't take a lot. It's at Epoch 22. And uh, the loss came from the sky and crashed uh, at around uh, 1, 2. Uh, that's the loss value. But you can see that the, the, the network is struggling with learning from the data. This might be from multiple problems. Maybe it's a too simple network and it cannot learn much from this. Uh, but also, maybe some relus died. So <laughs> you have to keep in mind this when uh, the networks don't behave as you expect them. But we would not expect from this kind of network to have like great results uh, because it's a simple network and also the data is very real world with all the flaws that comes with this. Yes? When you see flat lines, <laughs> usually it's not good. <laughs> In both pictures, you can see uh, that the, the orange line flatlined at uh, some point. See? Because usually plots will be like squiggly. You'll have small indents up and down. But when you see like a perfect flat line, and then you can check the actual values here. If you see that's the exact same value to the three decimals, you have some problems. You have to do something. Um, okay, now I said, okay, let's try with a buffier um, network which has multiple layers with more neurons and so on. This doesn't guarantee anything because what is the problem of a more deep, uh, a deeper uh, network? overfitting and it maybe it learns slower because it has more gradients to back propagate yeah so uh, deeper networks might have this problem but also they are able to learn more complex stuff because basically when you have a network and you have 10 layers doesn't matter if they are fully connected if they are uh, uh, convolutional if they are residual and so on all the nice stuff you have to think about networks like <clears throat> in the first layer, it extracts basic data. So in the case of convolutional neural networks, they extract like lines in different angles. The next layer will extract collections of lines, so basically like letter C type of lines. Then you get more and more complex data, geometric shapes, uh, non-geometric shapes. And then you get to recognize faces and objects and so on. So it is an increasingly complex uh, feature uh, extraction. <clears throat> um, that's why when you have a deeper network, it might be, it might take a little longer to learn what you want it to learn than a shallower network. But as you can see, the deeper network worked better. Yeah, it was more consistent. It didn't have any flat lines. Uh, it increased consistently, and it went to around to almost 60% accuracy. So for our problem is is good because imagine this: if the network says, "Hey, this is 70%," uh, and in reality it was 60%, for us it's not a big deal. It's it's close enough, yeah. So many of the errors are not actual errors, if we are, are indulgent. But <coughs> What is the problem with taking the pixel in a raster style? The problem is that when you take the first line and then you take the second line and concatenate it, two pixels, which are neighbors, will be like tens of pixels apart now. So you tear away locality. Yeah? And then some of the people around here with the mathematician sister obsessed with math might say, hey, let's go with the Hilbert curve. Uh, what is a Hilbert curve? Does anybody know about Hilbert curves? 
who studied computer, uh, not computer, uh, who studied math in, uh, in college might have heard about uh, Hilbert spaces and pre-Hilbertian pre spaces, which is blah, blah, blah. Um, the important stuff about, yes? Yeah, but that, that is, uh, it's very irregular, the, the, what you said. Uh, the, the, um, yeah, you can start from the Hilbert curve and adjust it to do exactly that. So, <coughs> Hilbert curves are a very nice tool where you can take a two-dimensional, dim or n-dimensional, but in this case, two-dimensional data and unravel it into a vector by keeping as much as the uh, uh, locality as possible. So you try to keep, you don't have like abrupt disruptions like in raster. When you have pixels which are very far apart, you make them neighbors, yeah? So you try to do this as much as possible. And you have these images which are, which explain more than I can do about what a Hilbert curve is. But now you say, oh, you want me to go through an image like this? <laughs> this is a nightmare. Well. Imagine that you have to go into 3D because images are 3D, they are not 2D. Actually, the limitation of the Hilbert curves is that they need <coughs> square uh, data, like n by n, n by n by n by n by n. <laughs> they don't allow you to have like p by n by m. So <coughs> we will treat images like three n by n separate images with the three channels and we'll go to by Hilbert curves through them. And by doing this, we install NumPy Hilbert curve. Somebody actually was bored, uh, very bored to, to implement this uh, package, but thank you, whoever you are. And we import the decode function, and we define a function called Hilbert flatten, which this is what does it. It takes an image, and it gives it uh, to you the, the vector. Uh, Let's pretend this is just magic. We understand what it said. We don't need to understand how it does because I don't understand it as well. <coughs> okay. And now we have a function read data set Hilbert, which reads the data set in the Hilbert fashion. So you read the image, you resize it, and then you extract the three channels, uh, blue, green, and red, because I don't know, OpenCV likes to have Sometimes uh, blue, green, red, sometimes red, green, blue. It's up to, it's like uh, mathematicians and engineers wrote code for this uh, library and each had their own uh, idea and said, no, I stick to BGR, not to RGB. Anyway, we take the channels, we apply the function for each channel, and then we concatenate the channels in a yet bigger uh, vector, and then we just extract the labels, so it's basically the same thing as before. We define the function. Here we have a sample array, so we could see uh, the, the Hilbert uh, curve. So you can see it has 12, 3, 11, 5, 5, 0, 7, 3. You can follow this small matrix to check that it actually does what it says it does. Now we will have to read it for our old data and you can expect that it will take a lot because it is not memory aligned, it is not efficient, it uses four and, and it will take a little. Um, but the idea of using a Hilbert curve is not uh, it's not saying that, yeah, this is, will be better than the precedent. It's about trying new stuff. If you, don't, if you have limited tools, try new stuff. It is very useful. Once in my life, this was useful for me. <laughs> so I'm hanging to it. Okay. The data has been read. We can see that the shape is similar to raster, so it has the same number of values, which is fine. And now we implement a, a model, the same model as for the first raster model. Uh, I don't think there's anything different. Okay. 
and we just run the model. We cross our fingers. I get, uh, for those of you who were in a dorm during college, I think you do, did the, the candle stuff, where you put candles to, to summon the, the spirit of programming to work for... <laughs> I did this a lot, and it worked. <laughs> uh, as you can see, uh, despite all our efforts, the Hilbert curve didn't help in this situation, and it is a little obvious why it didn't help because um, we are doing a volumetric estimation. We are not doing shape detection or stuff like this. So the locality is not so important as in object detection. So we might just did the very, very expensive fancy stuff for nothing. But it was worth exploring. This is the way of machine learning. Now, let's try with convolutional neural networks. So, what is a convolutional neural network? It is a network which uses convolutions instead of uh, fully connected um, layers. What is a convolution? Basically, you have a kernel, the one in the middle, three by three, which you put it on top of an image, and then you multiply element-wise and add all of them, and you will get one value which we, you will put in the new image in the center of the kernel. What does a convolution do? Why do we use convolutions? Can you give me an example for the real world? Yes. Exactly. So if you, if you do a convolution with a specific kernel, with specific values, you will just blur everything that you want. Uh, but also, you could do the reverse of the blur by using Kenny, but Kenny is not with filters, but you can use Sobel filters, which, which uh, accentuate the edges. So it's a reverse blur. So this um, convolution operation is very useful because it ties together data and keeps locality. So for my face, the eyes are very important, right? Because they are part of my face. So keeping my eyes with my face together, it is relevant as computer vision uh, uh, in relation to computer vision. But now, if you look at my face and my eye and you think about the, the background, the background has nothing to do with my eye. So it doesn't make sense to take all the pixels from an image and connect them, fu uh, fully connect them as we did before in a normal neural network. It makes sense just to connect uh, pixels which are in a certain area, which form certain objects. That's why it is important to use convolutions. This way, we don't use as many weights, we share weights, it, it is faster, and we extract features, automatic feature extraction. Besides convolution, we have the pooling operation, which takes an image and makes it smaller. By, for example, a two by two pooling uh, takes each two by two uh, subsection of the image and keeps only one value from that uh, subsection. So it shrinks the image by a factor of four. This is important for uh, reducing the complexity of the neural network so it will work faster because four pixels or one pixel might, uh, the four pixel might not have so, so much info besides the, uh, the single pixel, which is the highest value, the highest frequency. But also, the box pooling gives us a slight uh, rotation invariance. Because if you do repeated max pooling or average pooling, um, <clears throat> we could detect image uh, objects or other st stuff we are interested in, which are slightly tilted because we do this operation. And here is a very sh small gif of what a convolution operation on an image does. It takes an image and it scans a subsection and it 
con it uh, constructs a new image with the features it extracted from the original image. Good. Now, let's train a CNN. So, uh, we read the data set for the CNN, meaning that we read the image, we resize it, and we add the image as it is into the X vector. So, we can see that the X vector, which uh, contains the images, uh, has 103,018 uh, values, and it has 64 by 64 by 3, so it contains the original shape of the images. Now, <coughs> uh, we construct a convolutional neural network, which has uh, first a convolution uh, with 32 filters, of three uh, by three kernels. So, usually when we do, when we talk about convolution, we, we set the filters. So, if you want to uh, do the example, for example, uh, Sobel filter, this is a three by three uh, filter which does uh, edge detection. And as you can see, on one side, it has negative values, on one side, it has positive values, and on the middle, zero. So, when you put this on an image, and it finds a contrast, for example, where is an edge, where is an edge, there's a contrast between values. It amplifies the, that contrast. <coughs> uh, so, these are man-made filters. But the convolutional filters, which we have in convolutional neural networks, they are learned filters. So they start from random values, and they are adjusted in order to learn uh, certain features. For example, I forgot to put this. For example, these are the, the filters in a convolutional neural network. They don't make very much sense for us visually, because they are not only in 2D, they are in 3D, so they are in color space as well. But these combined can tell you that that's a dog, that's a car, and so on. Yeah? So if we were to manually make these filters, we will never do them, because they will not make sense for us. But the, 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 the network, by adjusting the weights, it gets to this result. It says, hey, if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. Okay, let's train this, oh, so we have 32 filters, three by three, and then we have a pooling layer, the one which reduce the size of the feature map. Then we have another convolutional layer with 64 filters, three by three, and afterwards we have this layer flatten, which does exactly what we did before. It takes an image and it gives it one vector, but the image which this layer gets as an input is not an image, it's a feature map. Because the convolutional layers before extracted features, so basically they did the feature engineering we were doing tens of years ago. And afterwards we have basically a neural network, a normal neural network with a dense layer of 64 and then the output with 11 values. We use the same optimizer, the same uh, loss function, uh, also, this plot training is for plotting uh, in real time. <coughs> and of course, convolutional neural networks will um, work a little uh, slower. There are more operations. They are more efficient operation-wise than uh, fully connected uh, networks. But one thing you can see from the start is that convolutional neural networks are so powerful, in the first two or three epochs, they just shot up to 60% like, like it's nothing. So they are, in three epochs, they did what the other, all the other models couldn't do in 30 epochs. Of course, it will plateau, it will have issues and so on, but the potential of convolutional neural networks is clear here in this, in this graph, yes.
Yes, you could use that uh, as well. I think it was uh, empirically determined. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I don't remember what was the reason, but yeah, I usually use softmax for the at the end. <coughs> but as I said, you you try multiple stuff, and what works, that's what you stick with it. Um, yeah. So the, this network will take its time. It will take a few minutes to to train. Uh, it kind of plateaued. You can see it, it's uh, around 70% accuracy on the validation. And now it will stay on this if it will not uh, <laughs> go down, <laughs> God forbid. I will stop the, the run so we could go uh, further. So here we have a deeper model. So it's like, uh, I don't know, let's say a Lenet on steroids. So we have uh, four convolutional uh, layers, two with 32 filters, two with 64 filters. We have two max pooling layers in between them. And uh, also we uh, added more dense layers after the flattened uh, layer. Um, Let's start the, the training. Now, since it's a, it's a deeper model, it will move even slower than the previous um, model, but it has more potential. And uh, actually, two years ago, there was a paper, I think, uh, I think in Efficient Net, they found a formula on which uh, of how deep, wide, and thick you will have to make your uh, networks in order to be optimal, blah, 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 what they said in the paper. And I actually tested it and it was very, very good because they made, made uh, heavy use of uh, residuals and uh, other layers. Um, so I think the question would arise, how deep can I make my network? Would I, if I make my network deep, would I need it to make it wide? Yes. <laughs> You cannot make like a very, very deep network and, we, and uh, to be very thin, yeah. Um, I, uh, oh, I'm, I forgot to put a link which was very nice for visualization. Um, I will put it in the, in the folder. You have access to the folder. It is a visual uh, uh, demonstration of the universal approximation theorem. And it lets you to have some neural networks, small neural networks, but it lets you adjust the weights and see which function they can approximate by adjusting the weights. And it is very, very useful to, 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 to see this. It is, it, and it is related to what does the depth of the network do, what the width of the network does, and so on. So, yeah. I will put it in the folder. Okay, so you can see that the, the second network reached 70%, it plateaued as well there. Um, so the extra layers didn't help that much, but they might help if we do uh, more training, more data. This is another thing. It's not about just how deep, how wide, or how thick your network is, how big is your data, because you, it, it is useful, it is useless if you have a, like a big data, a big uh, network with 1,000 images. Doesn't help. Okay. W also, when you go in deeper models, it is very useful to see how your model looks like. So, in Keras, you have a function called plot model which shows you a graphical representation of the, the model that you, that you defined. So something like this. This is very useful to see what layers you have, how they are connected. Here they are sequential, but imagine that you have residuals or LSTMs which are connected backwards with loops. Uh, also here you have the sizes of the of input and output of each layer. So this is very useful tool for 
I don't know, debugging, but understanding your, your network. Um, another useful concept is this dropout. What is dropout? Which neurons? Yeah, but which of them? Random. You, in uh, in uh, the dropout layer, you have a parameter called uh, uh, percentage something something. So you define how many of these uh, neurons die, so are ignored basically, and. This is done at random, so if you don't, what happens if you don't do it at random and you say, okay, the first 10? And what do we call people that do this? Biased. Yes. You introduce a bias in the network with no basis. You don't, you just put random stuff there, yeah? So, uh, by at each training step a deactivating random neurons, you make sure that there is no bias in this, yeah? And um, how does this help? Okay, yes, yeah, it is one way to put it, um, but let's, let's imagine another way, yeah, yes. Exactly, yeah. Um, let's go to a more to a less technical explanation. Yes? Yes, it, it is one way to see it. But let's go for a visual explanation. It, I think it would be... You... You identify me as a human, right? But you don't see me fully. You just see my torso and my head, and my hands. But you say, yeah, you're a human, of course, it's obvious. So basically the neurons which would give you the data from my feet are dead because there is an uh, occlusion occur occurring. So it forces neurons to be able to identify w what you want to identify, even if you don't have all the data. If you, if you have holes in the data, because we identify objects not by seeing them in their totality. For example, even if I will be like this, you don't see me fully because you don't see my back. <laughs> yeah? So this is very important. You need to force the neurons to be able to infer from partial data. And this thing also removes noise because noise is everywhere. And by uh, randomly cutting parts, because uh, the, the dropout would be like Blur, uh, not blurring, putting black rectangles on parts of my body, but just parts. By this, doing this random, you will remove almost all the noise because you will have the actual data, but the noise will, will go in that uh, uh, black rectangles. The same with the erosion morphological operation. So this is why dropout is a very, very powerful tool f for all kinds of networks. And here we have the same <coughs> We have the same um, model as before, but we have put a dropout layer with a 50% uh, chance of uh, ignoring. So basically each neuron in this layer will have a 50% chance of being cut off for this specific step. Now we started running. Now that I think of it, I should have started the, the training while talking about the dropout. Um, the thing is, 
come on. Yeah, Google says, hey, you, you, you run a lot, a lot, take a pause. <laughs> it happened before. Um, the idea is that if you want to see these, all these steps that I've done, but in a more detailed way, access the links I, I uh, put at the end of this, uh, this notebook, because there, there uh, you have the NIST data, you know NIST data, the one with digits, which was used in the 80s and 90s to automatically detect checks in America, like they were so advanced and we were like, yeah. Um, that is a very didactic uh, set of data because uh, despite the, the digits being handwritten, uh, they are very consistent, 28 by 28 uh, images, and they don't have real world variations like weird lighting, weird colors, or stuff we have at the shelves with, with the fog and stuff, yeah? So they have less variation, so it, they are easy to try these uh, uh, dropout and convolution networks and see how uh, they, are uh, they are impacted by the, the changes. Here we have real world data, so we might see that the dropout will not help because for how much data we have here, more than 75% 70, accuracy, it's kind of impossible to achieve. Not enough data, not enough, not good enough algorithm. And I, I tell you this because uh, we did the, like a big search for a week where we trained hundreds of uh, models and the best one was approaching 90%. But yeah, we trained it for a week, a grid search, and uh, that's what I was saying, that uh, you should not have expectations to go be beyond 70%. <coughs> but you can see it is reaching to that plateau, and it will stay there. Yes? Um, no, um, we, we did not do any of that because the camera is stationary, the fridge is stationary, so this will be the only way we will see data. Usually when you want to augment data, you augment it to be able to um, detect it in multiple uh, angles and so on. Yeah, I know. Uh, up until now, we had only one camera, so <laughs> uh, we had one camera in the shop, and we we had to do a lot. For example, we take we take one image every three minutes. Then we had to see which images are different enough to not have the same image. So check images for similarity and so on. Uh, when we will put multiple cameras to extract all data, perhaps we will uh, go to we will uh, have to do this. Um, I don't think the angle will vary that much because it's a PTZ, so it's... Yeah, yes, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, the, this approach with uh, using RGB data to detect, as you said, empty shells, basically, um, it, is, it was the exploration step um, because uh, we experimented with mono depth, you know uh, there are uh, there are some data sets for cars which uh, have sensors on them and get the depth, 
and uh, then they train uh, depth estimation models for that. And uh, I think that will be the way, the better way for this because it will have some sort of depth information. And this would be on top of that. So it will be like a voting system maybe. But yes, we will, uh, as you see, the, the data set is in September, so we didn't have much time to, to do a lot. But yeah, we will have to do the, the rotation of what you said. Um, yeah, and the mono depth um, could be very useful. And you, you will ask, why don't you use depth sensors? It's not only that. They are expensive, but let's say we have money. Depth sensors don't work well with glass. You have a glass door. And yeah, but may maybe it works on uh, something else, but you will have like glass and then you have foggy glass, maybe some ice on the glass because they might be freezers. So you will have lots of problems in this area. So yeah. <coughs> okay. Here we have, uh, I plotted the same model. And now let's plot the confusion matrix for this, uh, for this uh, matrix. And first we um, apply, uh, we predict all the test data set to see uh, how it worked, okay. So we have the, in the predicted vector we have the ground truth and we extract uh, <coughs> because the, the predicted will be a vector of probabilities you have to extract the argmax from the vector and here is an example of how the predicted vector will look afterwards so it basically gives us the class number and here we plot the confusion matrix I just took it for from the tensorflow documentation you have this function where you give it the ground truth, the predicted, and the name of the labels. And the confusion matrix, it is a very useful tool to, sh to tell you uh, how well the, um, the model works for uh, its purpose, right? So the confusion matrix tell, uh, on the main diagonal, you want to have all the values on the main, main diagonal and zero on other, other uh, uh, cells. Because you want the actual ground truth to match the predicted. If you have values on other cells besides the uh, main diagonal, those are er erroneous detections. And the confusion matrix with a heat map is very useful to see how well your matrix, uh, your uh, model works. And as you can see, we don't have much data with 10% and 20% because, yeah, we have just 1,000 and something images. Um, and I think that's kind of it. Happy smile at the end. Um, these are the, the two links that I, I've mentioned. Uh, they, are, they are very useful. I, uh, I did this workshop like five years ago. They, uh, they updated it to TensorFlow 2. But here you have like the course with videos and slides and so on if you want to know. But here you have the same style Google Colab. So you have a small description and then you have for each chapter you have a separate Google Colab notebook where you can run everything that they say. So this is a very didactic one with, with NIST and you could uh, experiment yourself with all the nice stuff that we talked about. Thank you, if you have questions, uh, I'll be taking them, yes? Yes. Yes. No, it was, I, I, I labeled this data, I, they were not, uh, I don't think we had any 10 and 20 percent. Because I know that 
I, I know. Yeah, you have you have to take uh, an equal distribution from each label in order to have, not have problems. Yes. Yeah, but here I, I can guarantee you don't have. Um, <coughs> yeah, but then you have to do a k k fold cross validation and all the nice stuff. If you do that, we will be here four or five hours. Um, if you don't, I, I mean, you, if you have questions, you can ask me, me, but we are also down at the booth with the other projects, with the checkout, checkout list store, as Gabi said, where you can see uh, real-time tracking and object detection for uh, products at the shelves and so on. So you can come visit us and check out. Okay, so you had a question and you had a question? No? Uh, yeah, we we tried some uh, semantic segmentation, but we didn't have you know, good enough data. You saw the data, how it was, and the segmentations were weird. They were looking like cancer cells, you know, like under microscope, and yeah. Um, but we tried also some regression models, and they were, I don't know, they didn't work very well. The, they tended to, to estimate negative values a lot, and we had to constrain them, and when we constrained them, the values were weird, so. But we will explore more of them. Uh, yes? The labeling tool? I did it. <laughs> Yeah, so, so usually I use, use uh, uh, label me and see that for computer vision stuff. But uh, as I said in the beginning, labeling with uh, label me was, it was very tedious for this one because you have like 11 classes and you have to put rectangles. Rectangles are not consistent with each other on different images despite them being on the same, yeah. So I cropped uh, automatically, I said okay, shelves are here, I cropped the images and then I just pop up in OpenCV on the, on the screen, I press one, two, three, zero. Yeah, so it's very fast. It's like 50 to 60 images per minute labeling. So it's like very fast, okay? How do we deploy the solution? Um, we, it's not deployed yet. It's still in the experimentation. Uh, but mo most likely it will be on a server with an API. So we will integrate with a Metro cache and carry system where the, <coughs> the shopkeepers have those phones or tablets or something like this. They have apps and the cameras will feed into our server and the server will send alerts to their app. You're welcome. Yes. Image processing. <laughs> uh, that's what our, we are experimenting with, uh, detecting the margins of the shelves to automatically detect the regions of interest, as you said. And uh, <coughs> uh, we are uh, we had some partial success with the uh, Ransack, uh, but there are, there are still problems because uh, we looked at the images; they were fine, and then the next day there was such a bright light on them because people changed bulbs and messed up our uh, detections. So we, are, we don't have yet a solution, 
but we look in the classic image processing tools for, for that because I don't know what I tried, uh, otherwise it didn't work that well. I know. And there's another problem with the, the idea of taking the image of the empty shelf. The empty shelf is not the same uh, because people uh, come and put like a piece of cardboard on it or put something or there's foggy door. So uh, we cannot go with that idea. If, if there were normal shelves, yeah, that would, we thought about that, putting a marker like a QR code or something on the shelf and that would be easy, but uh, for the fridges it's harder. Gabi, Gabi will back to the. No, the problem is, as you said, with the data sets. So imagine that we polled images for three weeks and we got like two or three hundred Im relevant images. Well, uh, that show the whole images because they were the only ones which were different enough to take into account. So now what Gabi said to scale, we, we will put like five, seven, ten, I don't know, cameras, how many there will be possible 
to uh, accelerate the rate of that data acquisition. So I don't know, after we get to 50K, 100K images, relevant images, we will have also experimented with some models to be able to put it in production. Because um, we might have some uh, leeway in how we adjust the false positive or neg neg uh, false negative. So we don't want to, ca to call the guy if it's, uh, so, so if the shelf is empty, it's imperative the guy to be called. But if he is called uh, when the shelf is not empty, it might not be that a big a deal. This is the business owner's decision. We will tell him we could adjust it one way or, no, or another. As Gabi said, we have to think about the costs. So we have some leeway in that way, in that direction. Yes. Was the inference time? How much does it take to train it? Um, I think. I think one hour, one one or two hours. I don't know. We we trained a few hundreds of models in a week. So, around the w an hour, let's say. Uh, you had the question? It's a cheap camera, I think we can <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about that. Thank you for, uh, for the suggestion. Actually, we had some, uh, some experience with uh, uh, polarization of light in our Check Out List pro uh, project where we had uh, lights, like parallel lights, and we had uh, the young effect of interferation <laughs> on, the, on the video. You couldn't see it with your eyes, but on the video. <laughs> yes. I think we will go w with the same model, but if we will see that there, most likely there will be some cases which we will fail we might train a separate model for it or retrain it with, uh, we might do, uh, how do you call it, I forgot. Transfer learning uh, for the new uh, data with the problematic data. I, I don't know, this is a uh, do and see. <laughs> Okay, so if you want to see our, uh, the other project which is more uh, nice and complex, come downstairs and we also have a VR game and some goodies, so we wait for you.